We're going to start back this evening's, uh, the final uh, grouping of talks with Arthur Jones. Uh, Arthur is the chair of the Department of Art and Design at the University of North Dakota. Um, and we talked quite a bit last night, so I want to actually read this part. Uh, he began his career in the 1970s at the University of Kentucky. He became interested in folk and outsider art, and organized exhibitions for regional museums, authored catalogs, presented papers, uh, served with the Association of Kentucky's Appalachian Center. In the 90s, he became department chair at Radford. We organized a class and a large exhibition on folk and outsider art, and most recently now at North Dakota. So, thank you, Gerard. Let's I'll okay. pass it on. Okay, thank you. I'll just put it actually on here because I'll switch it back and forth. It's a little complicated. Now. Okay. A little higher. A little higher? Yeah. Okay. 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 <clears throat> the the uh, presentation is titled Virtual Conservation of Folk and Outsider Art Environments. Uh, first, I want to extend a special, a special thanks to my former graduate student, Sean Krinkstadt, for his assistance with researching the James Smith Pierce collection of photographic and audio documents on folk and outsider art as well as for providing technical support in preparing the digital format of this presentation. The presentation addresses the issue of preserving and conserving documents pertaining to folk and outsider visionary environments, the latter which by their natures are often ephemeral. While conservators are concerned with documenting, preserving, and restoring original works, Many outdoor visionary environments cannot be fully rescued by conservation and preservation treatments or applications. Since the 1970s, I have been interested in the life stories as well as the works of artists who have worked outside the mainstream of fine art. Over the years, especially since the 1980s, I have photographed and video recorded folk and outsider artists and their works. In addition, I have worked alongside colleagues who dedicated many years of their lives to documenting folk and outsider art. One such individual was James Smith Pierce, whose photographs were widely used in John Beardsley's book, Gardens of Revelation, Environments by Visionary Artists. <clears throat> On the front page of that book, it cites him as the principal photographer. Most of Pierce's involvement as a collector and researcher of folk and outsider art took place while he was an art history professor at the University of Kentucky. Following Dr. Pierce's passing, the University of North Dakota acquired a large collection of his photographic and audio documents dating from the 1970s and 1980s. About seven months before his death, Dr. Pierce agreed to participate in telephone discussions with five graduate students who were enrolled in my course on folk and outsider art during the fall semester of 2009. Pierce, who lived in Belfast, Maine, held weekly discussions over a speakerphone with my graduate students in Grand Forks, North Dakota. In a sense, these weekly meetings became Professor Pierce's last seminar class. All of the class discussions were audio recorded and documented by PenCast. These recorded sessions, while lasting from about 20 minutes to over an hour, depending on how he felt each session, often addressed Pierce's collection of photographic and audio documents that are now the property of the University of North Dakota. This invaluable collection of documentary materials includes, among other things, Super 8 films, Kodachrome and Ektachrome color slides, and stereoscopic color slides that were taken in the mid-1970s of outdoor visionary folk art environments, some of which no longer exist and others that were significantly altered through time. 
This presentation will, pres will discuss the scope of the Pierce Collection and issues involving the longevity of photographic, audio, and digi dig digitally preserved documents, as well as how these documents might assist conservators in their work. Pierce was very active as a photographer and spent a great deal of time reviewing, viewing the world through his camera's lens. He was a keen observer and approached people and environment sites almost like a journalist. He photographed, filmed, and interacted with artists on a very human level. Among Pierce's photographic documents are nearly 10,000 carefully boxed color slides many pertaining to folk and outsider art. In addition, there are about 20,000 loose slides that have not yet been organized. The Pierce Collection also contains approximately 400 stereoscopic slides, of which about 200 relate to folk art environments. There are also 134 Super 8 reels that contain about 6,700 feet of film. About three hours of the Super 8 films are devoted to folk art. Dating from the 1970s, these films cover a wide range of visionary environments, among them S.P. Dinsmore's The Cabin Home and Garden of Eden, Mrs. Pope's Museum, Grandma Prisby's Bottle Village, Howard Finster's Paradise Garden, Driftwood Charlie's World of Lost Art, Rolling Mountain Thunder's Monument, Fred Smith's Wisconsin Concrete Park, and numerous other well-known and lesser-known sites. Completing the collection of documents are about 66 hours of aging audio recordings that contain Pierce's spoken notes as he observed sites, as well as voices of artists who created visionary environments, which I'll play you one right now. Continuing my discussion of issues pertaining to the Pierce Collection, I would like to present a visual overview consisting of selected segments from some of the Super 8 films and color slides, which are overdubbed with the voice of James Smith Pierce, explaining the importance of his documents <clears throat> to my students in 2009. Of course, he put 
kind of on um, power, in other words. Yes. And so an island there is very hesitant to uh, part with anything. N nevertheless, I was able to uh, get my first instrument. I mean, there was this guy who uh, had discovered Pinster and put him under Pinster and put him under contract. But uh, he wasn't well known at the, at the time, so I was able to get beautiful pictures of this garden um, when it was fresh, before it had been born, before it had been picked over. And so that's what put me on the fenster. And I, I took um, all these beautiful slides uh, where they, they seemed uh, to be freshly painted. And uh, there's a wonderful picture of um, not only the entrance uh, to the garden, or a entrance, but with a big cross next to this television uh, repair.
people are just extraordinary in terms of, of the, the, the vital force of them. Now I noticed that you have 63 color slides of um, Raymar Frisbee. Right. And the bottle village. Uh, you know, they, which was uh, made out of pieces from the dump to begin with. And then a rather severe earthquake came along and uh, just uh, shook everything up and pretty much uh, wiped it out. Um, but she, she was such a, a powerful uh, person. She had such an effect uh, on people that they tried to uh, gather together in the store the place and applied for government grants, which they never got. Uh, most of that um, has simply fallen to the ground. And without her personality uh, infusing plays, um, it um, is pretty much a pathetic ruin. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read with their website, um, you will see that um, it's pretty much been taken over by people um, who were inspired by uh, her positive attitude toward life and her immense creativity and as a kind of client to her. But insofar as it is uh, still a work of art, uh, there's hardly anything there. Who What is the potential for the uh, what is the potential for the Pierce collection of documents? First, the documents may be used to visually restore sites that have often been altered through time or destroyed. Pierce strongly believed in the importance of preserving his documents, which he felt were, in a sense, possessed with the living spirit of artists who made the environments. He also felt that when an environment deteriorated or vanished, all that remains of the artist's spirit might be his visual and audio records. When speaking about the Kola Foundation's restoration of Herman Rusch's Prairie Moon Museum and Garden in Wisconsin, Pierce said, without the artist's living presence and his gardens, much is lost and the site is not complete because at least half of the experience is lost. When discussing Grandma Prisbury, Pierce remarked that without her personality, the Bottle Village in California, which was badly damaged by an earthquake after his photographs were taken, is a, quote, pathetic ruin, unquote. Pierce's thoughts about the importance of the artist's living presence reminds me of an experience I had a few decades ago when I visited S.P. Dinsmore's, the, uh, the Cabin Home and the Garden of Eden in Lucas, Kansas. While there, I purchased a reprint of Dinsmore's book about his environment and read it as I journeyed through the site. I'm reading the book while observing the environment seemed almost like having Dinsmore there with me. On one page, the elderly Dinsmore discussed one of the cement trees he had created and how it would be affected over time by vegetation he had planted. Say, that tree will be a beauty, he said. I want to see it in about 10 or 15 years from now. I may be in the mausoleum. If I am, some dark night, I will slip out and take a look at it. Or some other people will see it, which will be just the same. Reading these words further personalized my experience because I, as among some other people, became the surrogate for the living embodiment of Dinsmore. On the other hand, Pierce's comments about the importance of the artist's living presence might be extended at the Garden of Eden to include the artist's dead presence, creepy as that may sound. Indeed, paying one dollar to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Dinsmore 
who had already been dead for over 40 years when I saw him, further personalized my experience. Looking at Dinsmore's dead face through the window of his coffin and experiencing his living thoughts by reading his book added an important dimension to my experience at the Garden of Eden. Without this dimension, my encounter with the environment would have been much less powerful. Since visiting Dinsmore's environment decades ago, the site as well as the artist's remains have been deteriorating. To remedy this problem, the property was acquired last year by the Kohler Foundation, an organization specializing in the preservation and restoration of folk architecture in art environments. So there is hope for the site as well as for the future of Dinsmore's remains. Recalling my experience at Dinsmore's environment a few years ago helps me to better understand Pierce's thoughts about the importance of the artist's presence and also how slides, films, and audio tapes might help to restore this factor after artists are long gone. Pierce viewed each environment on a very human level in which the artist's infusion of personality is immensely important. With his photographic records and audio recordings of conversations with artists, I'm sorry, his, his photographic records and audio recordings of conversations with artists contribute greatly to what survives of the creative spirit of artists within their created environments. There are several challenges ahead in regard to the preservation and conservation of the Pierce collection. These include problems with the old technology involving aging slide film and audio tapes, which are well past their prime and are gradually deteriorating. During the last few years of his life while struggling with terminal illness, Pierce made efforts to digitize his slide images. But he also realized the pitfalls of the new technology and the false hope it suggests to many people who believe that it offers eternalness. Whereas many manuscripts handwritten on parchment during the Middle Ages survive today, uh, electronic information recorded only a decade ago might be more difficult to access. With this thought in mind, Pierce made initial attempts to both digitize film images and print them on archival paper. Being terminally ill and financially constrained, he made little progress in his preservation efforts. Since the University of North Dakota acquired the Pierce Collection, we are making serious efforts to carry on the preservation project he envisioned. As we proceed, however, we realize that the costs involved with the new technology are significant with sizable investments needing to be made about every three to five years. And when I say sizable, I'm thinking in terms of university budget considerations, not the rest of the world. <clears throat> the rapid acceleration of changes in the new technology will likely make it necessary to upgrade even more often in the future, requiring purchases of new computers and software at an ever-increasing frequency. Although the preservation and conservation of the Pierce Collection may prove to be time-consuming and costly, the photographic and audio recordings are invaluable as historic documents that provide time travel for viewing earlier states of visionary environments. While thousands of photographic and audio documents pose immediate problems involving their care and preservation, they also offer long-term potential for conservation and preservation of the sites they document. The photographic images reveal, de reveal details about how the environments appeared several decades ago that can be useful when restoring sites. The University of North Dakota Art Collections plans to organize a traveling exhibition based on the materials in the Pierce Collection. On display will be photographic panels, video montages based on selected slides with segments of Super 8 films and audio clips, stereoscopic slides, and interactive computer components. Here is an example of a montage incorporating selected slide images and an audio recording of Howard Finster in his environment 
uh, about 1978. <laughs> By combining film and slide images, including stereoscop stereoscopic ones, along with segments of artists' voices on audio recordings, <coughs> lost or altered alignments may be revitalized as virtual restorations. Slides from different vantage points and panning shots in film will offer viewers a chance to take virtual journeys through synthetic environments based on how they appeared decades ago. We hope that such an ex exhibition will raise public awareness of the importance of historic preservation for visionary environments as well as the photographic and audio documents that may contribute to their longevity. And I'm just adding a quick pic, uh, postscript to this. Uh, many objects were previously located within environments um, documented by Dr. Pierce through photography and film uh, have been removed and are now in museums or private collections. Uh, so I have a couple of images of uh, works that were photographed by Pierce uh, as they now appear in, collect in a collector's home. Um, you'll see, for example, a work by Mary Tillman Smith, uh, which is over here, and now I'm moving it to a wall over there. <clears throat> so this is how it appears now, and this is how it appeared in his photograph from 1986. Uh, here's another example <clears throat> of a 1986 uh, image from uh, the environment of Mary Tillman Smith. Oops. Everything considered, the Pierce Collection is a vital resource that needs to be preserved. Thank you. And do we have any questions? Who has the first question? I'm sorry? Okay, well, I had a long association. And by the way, I think I, uh, there was a, a little, one portion there that I, I removed, and that is uh, <coughs> I, I, my, my uh, PowerPoint jumped. <coughs> but I was uh, going to add that th these documents can also help to authenticate works. Because if you see the same work in an environment, and they can also help to date works. So uh, I thought I would just add that. The reason why they wound up in North Dakota is because uh, I used to be a professor at the University of Kentucky, and Jim Pierce was a longtime colleague of mine. And it got to a point when he was dying from cancer that he uh, was very concerned about his legacy. And he was more than that, much more than that, he was concerned about the living spirit that would be lost when his documents are destroyed. Now, being a university professor, I know that uh, without someone like me uh, trying to do something with these documents, that they're liable to simply be uh, digitized and thrown away. This is what professors often do. <laughs> they basically put them to use. Uh, but they have a great value as, as uh, important historic documents in their own right. Plus, Pierce was a really outstanding photographer. I will add that. So they wound up there because I'm there. It's, a, again, the same human level that, that uh, led him to devote his you know, interest to these people that he met. Other questions? I have one question for you, um, okay. Arthur. Yes. So as these, the collections get digitized, uh, will they be available just through the university or available online for, for viewing of scholars outside, or how will they be made available? Uh, the university, I don't, I don't see the university as a, 
as an organization that is trying to, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, make money off the documents, and I would like to, uh, my, I would foresee uh, a time when they would be uh, available to uh, a wider range in the public. Uh, they might, and I, exactly how that will be worked out, I don't know. But uh, I see them as uh, there for the use of scholars and for the general public to a certain extent as well. You know, depending on uh, how we set it up for access. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.